They left their homes, they left their families, they left their land. Why? Like their ancestors before them, to provide better opportunities for the next generation. These are their stories, told with tears, laughter, and triumph. These are stories of their history, their challenges, and their victories. As Native people, when we share our stories, we are giving you a gift. So listen to their stories as they share their gifts of how and why people from across North Carolina, from the land of the Cherokee to the land of the Lumbu, from Saponi to Halawasaponi, from Kohari to Meharry, from Okanichi Saponi to the Wakamasuan. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they moved from their homes, their families, and their native land to the urban area of Greensboro, High Point, and Winston-Salem. Listen to their stories of pride for their native history. Listen to their stories of strength as they encountered opposition and courage as they faced racism. Listen to their stories of resilience as they thrived in a world that treated them as the invisible people. To the generations of native children that will grow up in the triad area, listen to the footsteps of your ancestors I'm Valina Hammond Everett, an enrolled member of the Lumbee Tribe. I was born in Scotland Memorial Hospital, which is in Lorenburg, North Carolina, near Robinson County, where both my parents were from. My mother grew up in the Pembroke area and my father was from Fairmont in Robinson County, our land of the Lumbee, as we're proud to call it. My earliest recollection of home was on my great-grandfather's tobacco and cotton farm on the outskirts of Pembroke. And in the eighth grade, my parents announced we were moving to King, and I was so upset. It's like I was finally feeling comfortable in the school away from the homeland where I'd lived the first eight years of my life to now as a teenager. You know, I've got to change schools again, start as a ninth grader at a new school where I knew no one in the community. Um, but we had to relocate because of employment. Our family relocated to um, a small town north of Winston-Salem called King, and it was a predominantly all-white community as well. My name is Sandra Hunt. My uh, maiden name is Jacobs, and uh, I'm from... Clinton, North Carolina, in the eastern part of North Carolina. Uh, I came from a very large family. Uh, there was nine children, and my mom and dad. And we were a very close family. We, we, our survival was working on the farm. That was the only life I ever knew, was working on the farm and being there with my siblings and my mom and dad. I'd never been outside the box from home, my husband decided that he would come to Greensboro and seek work here before we got married. And uh, he came to Greensboro and he started working uh, with, he had an uncle that lived here. We got married, we came to Greensboro. And oh Lord, it was like going out of the country to me because I had never been out of Clinton, North Carolina, you know, out from the surrounding areas around uh, Clinton. And I was just a lost soul. I was just a lost soul when I came to Greensboro. Okay, my name is Stan Grady. I'm from the Kohari tribe, officially from Wayne County where I grew up and went to school. Um, I left there in 1960, came to Greensboro oh, College, man, and I oh, never went back oh, to do it. Oh, I had my residence in High Point where I began working, teaching in the public schools. My name is Janice Grady, and I'm from the Lumbee Tribe. I'm a member of the Lumbee Tribe. 
I was raised in uh, um, Robinson County, and, uh, and I'm a, from a family of 10 children. And in 1975, uh, I graduated from uh, Pembroke. I decided I wanted to teach, and that was my degree in teaching, elementary. Uh, and I decided, okay, I needed to move from Robinson County. I wanted to go and teach somewhere in a bigger uh, city. Um, I grew up in uh, rural Robinson County, uh, Jessica, born in 1936. And um, on my grandfather's farm, and uh, there were my, my uh, dad and mom, uh, my mother was uh, Curly Emanuel, and my dad was Willard Law Cleaner. And uh, so there were 10 children born to my mom and dad, and I was the eldest. But Lonnie and I moved in uh, 19, 15, 1960. We had a son, Bill, by that time. Bill was four months old. And when Lonnie got out of the Army, I was teaching school and very happy very content to stay there. But Lonnie got out of the Army, there was no job for him because he did not want to teach school. My name's Mesa Dye Lewis. I married George Cleveland Lewis, February the 22nd, 1965, in Robinson County, where we started our family. Nora was my firstborn. Laura was my second and George Jr. was the third. He was our, our boy. And uh, and it was rough raising a family in Robinson County. So we moved from there early when they were real young, two or three or four years old. My name is uh, Devon Burnett Sr. I'm from Clinton, North Carolina, Sansom County area. Um, lived down there approximately 20 years, 21 years. Graduated from uh, Midway High School, which is between Clinton and Dunn, North Carolina. Um, went to Fayetteville Tech for architectural drafting um, at the end of that, my last year there in 72. Uh, started looking for work. I had a couple of instructors, one from Greensboro, one from Winston Salem, that said to work with Plentiful in this area. Um, wouldn't have any problem getting a job. And my wife at that time she had a couple of brothers living here in Greensboro, so I figured we wouldn't have any problem finding a place to stay for a while. And came up here looking work in the architectural drafting field. That's one reason we left it in no particular Robinson County at that particular time. There wasn't that many jobs down there for in it at that particular time. So we come up this part of the neighborhood. With the opportunities were down here was a whole lot greater, you know, in Gilbert County. As far as manufacturing stuff, it was a whole lot greater in this part of the country than it was in Robinson County. You know, at that particular time, uh, matter of fact, at that particular time, Jobs are plenty for everywhere. There was just no jobs. There was like one big factory in Clinton that you could work at and make some money other than working on the farm for four or five dollars a day, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was very hard for a couple getting married mm -hmm. and uh, with that uh, income. But his reason for coming here was that we didn't want to live that kind of life that we was living in Clinton because there was really no advancements at that time and we wanted to have a family and we wanted our children to have an opportunity to have, you know, have good schools. And the reason that uh, I did want to come to Gifford, to uh, Greensboro, was to have better job opportunities and I felt like that I had something to offer, and I felt like he could offer me something. It was so hard even growing up, and we didn't want our children to grow up and have to be raised like we were raised down on the farm and having to work so hard. We picked cotton like $3 a day all day long. We didn't want our children to have to be raised and work on a farm, and then the end of the year we didn't have anything to show for it and all. We wanted better for our children, because it was my goal that when I got old enough and got married, that I wanted to move away from there to where I could better my life and have a better life for my children.
I think there are more opportunities in this area than the parts of the state we were raised in. Certainly the culture level is higher here. Uh, the educational opportunities are great and the, the job opportunities are great as well if you uh, have upward mobility. Uh, we have embraced uh, a lot of people since we've been here that have embraced us. I think the basic reason that the most of the Indians came up here was to find better a sell. better opportunity for themselves. You know, growing up there, it was just kind of taken for granted. You know, when you leave it, you, I've grasped it in a different way than than, I, than cousins and relatives that I have down home. They just, like I said, kind of take it for granted. And it's always been a part of their nature, and maybe they don't see the uniqueness but, you know, having, for me, having felt comfortable and safe, you know, and, and that uh, Native environment nurturing uh, country living there to, you know, be pulled up and uprooted and moved to an area. It was still rural, but we were next to, and King, we were next to, you know, what's the Salem, not far from Greensboro, and, you know, uh, we're able to you know, closer, some family then had relocated to Charlotte and the Raleigh area. We just were able to um, integrate um, into opportunities that uh, aren't available uh, in uh, the Pembroke and Robinson County area, I remember. Uh, my name is Kenneth Jones, Jr. My dad's uh, obviously senior. Uh, my mother is Linda Pierce Jones. Let's see, my grandmother, uh, my grandfather Jones, grand grandmother Jones, they were both residing in uh, Pembroke at the time uh, that they passed. Uh, they had moved back. They were, uh, they come to Greensboro and I would imagine they were here for uh, several decades till my grandfather retired and then they moved back to Pembroke, in which my grandfather Pierce did the same. Uh, what was interesting was at the time that seemed to be the trend was to uh, move the Greensboro area uh, for jobs, uh, be able to support your family and everything. And then with the intent of moving back to Pembroke uh, for retirement. And that was actually the intent of my father as well. Every other weekend I was still trying to make it down to Pembroke. And I, you know, I think that's just something that was instilled for me from my, my parents. You know, this is your, this is your home, this is your down home. And, and it became so instilled in me as soon as I got my driver's license in my car, well, that's where I'm heading. You know, I'm heading to Pembroke every time I get a chance. Looking back on it now, you know, my parents, my grandparents came to Greensboro to seek for jobs. And so obviously they didn't have a whole lot of money. So they didn't stay in the nicest neighborhoods or, or the safest areas because they were limited on the amount of money they had. But they work hard to provide money or to get money to provide for the family. Whereas now, you know, you have your second generation, third generation coming back around, you you'll end up having, you know, the Lombies living in the night nicer suburbs or, or being a little bit more integrated in the community. Uh, and now we're able to afford to live in the in the nicer neighborhoods or, or if we, you know, choose to. Um, but, you know, it, it was kind of surprising to me, you know, the, the difference in how things had changed so much at the time. My name is Wando Walker Atmore. I'm from the Lumbee Tribe. I live here in Greensboro and have resided here all of my life. Um, my parents moved here in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, they started out in Burlington. My dad was working in construction. He had just got out of um, the uh, Marine Corps and he went down to, at the time my mom was living in Cumberland County, went to Cumberland County, picked my mom up and brought her to a whole new world. <laughs> um, so when I graduated high school, I went to Pembroke, um, and which was experience too. Um, I had been around my people here in this community. We would go back home to visit family, but I never lived there. And so to go and to see your people 
every single day was a culture shock for me. I mean, no matter how much into my tradition and culture that I was, to be embraced or to be amongst your own people, there's no better feeling than to have someone by you that understands what you're going through because you don't have that relatability in a urban area because there are so far few and in between us and sometimes it's hard to always touch the next one that's in your community. So. It, it, it wasn't an easy life when we first came up here. It was not easy because the people didn't want to accept you. If you weren't, if you weren't black or white, they didn't accept you. To uh, have our identity. I'm not black, I'm not white, I'm not, you know, I'm a Lumbee. And I say that's an Indian. And I always will be until the day I die, or that I'd be still be an Indian, but that's what I am. If I could, somebody come up to me and say, you don't look Indian, that's okay, I don't care what you think, I know what I am. I know what I am, so we went from there. First job I got, this lady I was working with told me, she said, uh, you don't look Indian because you don't have the high cheeks. You know, most Indians got them high cheeks. And she said, well, show me your high cheeks. And I turned around and showed me. <laughs> <laughs> My son did. He felt like, because he was Native American, and the schools, he was different. And we tried to, you know, tell him, you know, you were no different than anybody else. But uh, I, I think that he felt different because he was, his skin was different from the white and, they, and the black. And we had to teach him a lot of things about, you should be proud of who you are. You are Native American. And, and, he, and, he, and he's really, like I say, he's really uh, proud of who he is. But I just tell him, you know, he, when he went into his job, he was saying a lot of people said, you know, that, uh, you know, he, what, are you Mexican? What, what are you? And he said, I'm Native American. And, and they, and you know, they, he, and he said, well, people look at, like, at me like I'm different. And I said, you are different. And hold your head up high. And that's what you have to do is, you know, and be proud of who you are. And, and I tell anyone that. I would tell anybody with any ra a race that just pr be proud of who you are. We didn't get to go to town that much. But when we did go to town, they had faucets for blacks and white, and we didn't know where to drink water because there was no place for Indians. If you was light-skinned, you wasn't noticed, and you could drink from the white fountain. But if you were dark-skinned Indian, you had to drink from the black fountain. And it was the same way going to the little movie theaters and things like that, and at the barber shop. If you was uh, if you was dark skinned, uh, some of the barbers would not even touch your hair, you know, even though they had beautiful hair. But if you was a darker color, uh, you was not allowed to go there. And so a lot of our uh, parents and grandparents they cut their own children's hair, you know, and I. I just could never, I didn't understand why this gap, you know, was there as a child and I would ask my mama, you know, why, why are we treated that way? Why do, do they not have an Indian name? Because that was the only name we knew, you know, that was the only life we knew as being Indian, even though we were not federally recognized uh, from my grandparents on through. We were always known as the Indians. We didn't know no difference. And I just couldn't understand. And Mama would try to explain it to me. And at the end of the day, what she would end up saying is that we're very special people. We're unique people. Little children would walk up to you and say, yeah, you, you're not Indian. Um, you don't have on any feathers. You don't have any leather on. And I said, that's a television Indian, and most of them are Mexican or they're white people with brown makeup on. And that, um, and sometimes I'd be facetious and I'd say, 
well, I haven't killed a bird to wear the feathers today, or um, I haven't put on my Indian, my Indian clothes. I have advocated for my people from the time that I came here, uh, and for my children uh, in particular, because uh, we were discriminated against in jobs, housing, um, child care, but we overcame. Uh, and, and I remember an experience when Jennifer and my daughter were in seventh grade here, and uh, the teachers would normally, when they had to uh, turn their report in by race, and uh, they would say, all those whites raise your hand, all the blacks raise your hand, and that was it. And Jennifer and Sharon, both of them, you know, had come from this strong background, didn't raise their hands, and they, uh, and they uh, didn't raise their hand. She did this about three times, and finally she said, all right, somebody's trying to be funny, because she knew there were uh, two that weren't raising their hands. And Jennifer spoke up and said, Miss Soitso, Sharon and I are Lumbee Indians, and you didn't ask for the Indians. And she thought she was being, uh, they were being smart aleck and sent them to the office. Our history was non-existent. And we would touch on Native American history once a year, if that much, if that often, that kind of thing. But it was until I was in the, it was like ninth or 10th grade that the Lumbees were added to our, our North Carolina history books. But up until that point, we weren't Indian. And then when, when teachers would, you know, I can remember back in the day at school, in schools when they would ask by race for you to stand up. So they would do a head count according to race. And I remember when they would do that in school. And okay, black children raise your hand, all the black children raise your hand, all the Indian children raise your hand. And you're saying, really? I put my hand up. You're not Indian, a teacher would tell you. And so you would you would have to deal with that and, and we, you know, being as, as dark as we are, we would have to deal with that. We went through that. But that was an every year occurrence. And I can't remember when it stopped. I don't remember if, if in high school they actually did that or not. It seems like they did do a head count as well, all the way up through high school. But that feeling of first and foremost, you know, they would do the head count at the beginning of the school year, you raise your hand and they're if you were lucky, there might be another Indian child in the school. Very seldom in your classroom, you'd always be the one singled out with your hand raised. And then they would question your identity and tell you who you were, who you were not, and that kind of thing. And again, it, it does go back to you, you don't look Indian. So, you know, that's one of those things that we all faced. But TVN. when they did realize, oh, well, you are Indian? Okay, well, it's almost Thanksgiving. Would you mind standing up in front of class and tell her? Why I gotta stand in front of class and tell people, you know, now you want me to be Indian, why do I need to come up here and dance in front of class? And those were things that we faced that was, it was ugly, it was the ugly part of who we were now. I can remember my freshman year in, in high school, we had, I had an English teacher and she had wrote in the newspaper, school newspaper, that the minority students um, in the school, that they were trying, that they were all dumb and that they were trying to pacify them and just get them out of the school. So we had a big riot in the school, huge riot. All the kids were tearing up stuff. Um, the administration came and they separated everyone. They sent the whites and um, Asians to the auditorium. They sent the blacks and the Mexicans or Hispanics to the gym. Like I said, at the time there was only two native students. So Keith and I went up to the um, principal's office and we asked them where do you want us to go told us that we weren't a part of this that it was a black and white issue and they told us that we need to call our parents and be sent home it was devastating that a school that I was going to that I wasn't a part of it. Um, take, take your time I can remember Miss Rope coming out there to the school they had a big write-up in the paper. It was an awful thing, and, and to have, to be so proud of who you are, and to know that you didn't mean anything at the time. Um, this was a, a race relation in my school that I couldn't be a part of. 
because I wasn't black or I wasn't white, we weren't included. And so Keith and I were sent home. Miss Ruth, the next day, came out there to the school and yeah, she turned it out. You know, I have two students here that are trying to preserve what they have and, and to be who they are, and yet you just write them off as they're nothing. And, and I can remember I was, I was 14, I was devastated. My mom called my mom, my mom came out there and picked me up and she didn't really realize what was going on at the time. I just called her and told her, they're sending us home, come get me. But they weren't sending us all home, they were sending Keith and I home and, and, and everyone else was a part of it. And it was, it was a difficult transition for me, even though Growing up, I had dealt with the, the jokes and, and everything. Oh, there's really no Native Americans around here. You know, y'all are fake. Y'all all killed off and, and try to preserve your culture and also teach it to those that were ignorant to it. It was a process. The hardest thing for me, I mean, this is real hard. I nor don't even know this and stuff. When me and my husband tried to buy this house in 1978, I hadn't, I don't even think I've even told Fred about this and stuff. This community here was all white, white. They had just built them brand new apartments over there. And because we were ending moving here, this community didn't want us here. It took us three months. We started trying to buy this house in April. And it took us from April to July to get in this house. And i never forget I was working with a lady at work that lived the second street from here. And I was telling her, that we were going to move here, we're thinking about buying this house. She said, well, I don't see how y'all can buy that house because they don't let nothing but white over there. And it hurt my feelings so bad and stuff. And the only reason we got this house and stuff was the company I worked for, me and George worked for the same company, Davis Furniture. We couldn't even go to the bank and borrow the money to get this house because we were ending. He went, John Davis went, and he co-signed and he borrowed the money and let us have the money to buy this house with and we paid him back and that's the only way we got this house and that's the only reason we've never sold this house and really I know the lady to the day and still got a good relationship with her that sold us this house and all and stuff and, and it was it, that's how hard it was for us to get this house and she had told me and George said in five years y'all will have enough of equity build up y'all can sell this house George said ma'am as hard as it was for us to get this house he says we'll never buy another house and we haven't then why did you want to move here if you knew that your neighbors didn't want you here they said Allen J. School, they said Allen J. School was the best school they was in High Point. And that's the reason why I did it for my children. I wanted them to go to the best school they were here. My children still came home with these same questions. Are you a real Indian? Are you 100% Indian? And can you speak Indian? Well, my first thought was that I had failed until I heard their answers. And what I soon realized was that I may not have been able to change their environment. What I was able to do and still doing is raising confident Indian children where they now can respond. They don't answer those questions, but they do respond to those types of questions because they do know their Lumbee history, they know their Lumbee culture, and they have a wonderful sense of identity and self-esteem and pride as Indian children. When it comes to cultural identity, Elena and I, we both dance. Um, 
both dance traditional and I did tribute that to my mom because my mom was taught by her mentor, which in turn she taught us to keep our culture alive, considering we don't live at home where you see any people around the corner every day. We have a good Indian community in Greensboro that dances and everyone calls us them Greensboro Indians. They all know who we are and we all just as much in our culture as anyone down home. So, you know, we try to keep it alive here to educate people who don't know what Indian is because you don't see them like you live down home. Okay, I remember she used to make our regalias for us, and then I guess she she figured she needed to teach us. And so I remember I've got a um, a shawl that she half made, but I made the other half because she made me, and uh, she made me fringe it. But every everything that was on there, she taught me what it was. Like there was there's symbols on it. This is the fire, and this is the water, and she explained to me what it was. And I uh, remember one time when I was fringing the shawl or something, I must have poked my finger and got a little bit of blood on it, and I continued to fringe my shawl. She grabbed my hand. She didn't like this. Don't you ever bleed on none, <laughs> bleed <laughs> on none of this regalia. Mm -hmm. She took me to the bathroom, and she put a, um, a Band-Aid around it, and she said, and she tried to explain to me why it was so important, you know, what I had, you know, and what the purpose of it was, and the traditions of it was, and what, how to respect stuff that I've done myself. After seeing Charlene walk by and tell me all about Guilford Native and meeting and becoming involved with Guilford Native is that there was a network, you know, where we could all lean on each other and really, really make it make a difference, make a difference. Um, and I'm, I'm blessed, that's one of the greatest things that's come out of me being here in the Triad area, is uh, not only the opportunity through our cultural festivals and so forth, but actually the, the friendships and the support that you have uh, are able to um, connect with uh, through our, our closeness and support within the Native community. Having seen, for example, our art gallery and then the Native church when it was established. And the uh, man that started the church, I can't remember his name to save my life, but Miss Ruth was involved in it too, mm -hmm. getting our church started. And uh, they come together because there were so many Indians up here that they, they come together and said that the Indians There's needed a need. church. There was a There's big a need. need for a native church in Greensboro. Big need. So they got together and they uh, purchased the church where we're at now. And I think it was, what, it was three or four years after the church, after we uh, got to that church, our church paid full, paid in full. Like donations. The DS said if we raised so much money, they raised it all. Yeah. Yeah. And it was paid in full. So that was a blessing. That was a blessing for us. And when the Native began with education, and then we went to social services, helping the people get any need, need they had. And then we went to uh, cultural with our first powwow. And then we went to economic development you know, with our uh, Gilford Native Industries, Nora, and building houses and selling them and so on. And then we went to spirituality. And those are five of the basic things that, that uh, guide uh, an Indian tribal community. It became, a, it became a place for people to come and get help and education in uh, social services, even clothing. We had a huge clothing closet. We had a, a pantry. Churches and different ones would give us food. We could uh, give people maybe a three-week supply or at least a week supply of groceries. And fortunately, a lot of it would be canned hams or canned meat. And uh, so we were able to help them. And if not, urban ministries and social services instead of them having to go through there and fill out all that information we could give them a referral and they would accept it we are on our fourth generation 
you know, and that continuity I think has, has, has played an important part for our students now being more successful in education. Because when our parents came, when my parents came, you know, it wasn't for education for them, but for jobs. But they quickly saw, you know, the opportunities that are available for education and employment and training and so forth, different programs. And then the next generation now, you know, saying, okay, you know, it's just uh, a continue to build on a foundation. He said the uniqueness of your gallery is what you're doing. It's all Indian artists, it's all Indian art, and we tell the story. And that's that's the way the board is. We tell, the board tells our story. The people, anybody like North that goes out and speaks, we tell our story. Learning about everything you guys have taught me, you know, and I think, I think that's, that's where it matters, is I can, I can answer those questions with confidence. And every chance I get, I go back down to Robinson County. We just went a couple weeks ago to Maxton for the week to visit my cousin. So I stay connected to where I came from and, you know, where, what helped make me. And so I go pick wild strawberries in the field, kill chicken. And so I'm, I'm familiar with all of it. And, I'm really, I have to say now, me being the third generation, I'm appreciative of what my mother and what my grandparents had to go through to help make me who I am. No, I said you can't look and say, well, I I come from a, a family that can't afford you know, to go to school, or I can't afford uh, Jordans or anything, but you know, you've got to have a lot of standards. You've got to have high standards and say, I can do just as good as anybody else can do. And that's what I tell uh, a lot of children. Uh, you know, you just have to uh, say, I can do it. I Don't let anybody uh, hold you back from doing what you really want to do. Um, no matter what color you are, you can do it. Always have very high standards. Never seek to lift the Lord yourself and rise above all situations because it can be done if you work at it. You have to be willing, you have to be committed, and, and you can't succeed if you try. Uh, continue to work for our federally, rec federally recognition and to stand and believe in what they are and who they are, to never forget who they are. and. Uh, I seen that in the past. I saw that in the past where it was easy for some of them to just slide through the cracks other than to deal with it, to say I'm either black or I'm white <laughs> and not deal with, oh yes, I am an Indian. And that our children, our future children coming up won't have the kind of problems that we've encountered. I want them to be a proud people. I want them to be a proud people and proud of who they are and not have to sit in the classroom and hold their head down and be embarrassed because they're Native American. And I want to see the stereotype just disappear and stop it, to just drop it. And I, that's what I want to see our young people working on, to strive to be who they are and that others would know who they are and to be proud. I always said I don't want to end up with a lot of regrets. And there are few, anybody would do some things differently, but I'm basically pleased. I, I am happy. I think happiness is a state of mind, and we're all happy at times, but to say that anybody is happy all the time, I don't think so. It, it, it depends on how we uh, identify, but I'm satisfied, and I'm, I, I kill, still have hopes and dreams. My daddy always told us, no matter where you go to in life, always remember your past and where you've been wrong from, because it will always help you to be thankful for where you're going and what you achieve in life. He said, no matter what you achieve in life, don't ever forget where you've been wrong from. 
and that's why I'm thankful, even though it was hard, but I'm thankful from the roots that we come from. Uh, my mother passed away. She would say, why do you always say when you're going down home, your home is King and Kernersville? I said, no, Mom, my home is Robinson County. I said, I played in that dirt from the time I was able to make mud pies to uh, taking the straw from Uncle Layton's fish pond area there in Connie and I making our little house outlined with straw needles. I said, uh, my home is still Robinson County. I, I love everything about being Native. I love being different um, because that's what we're considered. I don't care what you say, I am who I am and this is the only life I know and you can't tell me who I am in my heart. My skin don't make no difference. It's who I am. And I want our people and our children to know who they are and to continue to fight and stand up for who they are.